so we had a, a bit of a change in, in what we were going to be doing uh, for this session. The content is still the same as in the abstract. Uh, we've got uh, Patrick Lang is, is going to be um, presenting a sort section in the middle. Uh, and Narian, who was in the, um, in the uh, program, is, is not able to be with us uh, today. So um, how many people in here um, are already running Docker in at least a dev test environment? OK, and how many people are running Docker in, in not just single containers, self-contained containers, running in a complete application with network containers and so on? OK, a lot less than put the hands up the first time. And, um, so uh, that, that's really what I, I want to talk about here, about the, what, what it takes to build something in large scale. Uh, and when I say large scale, I mean both in terms of the, the scale of the number of instances of individual containers and the agents that they work on, but also being able to build a complex application that's made up of multiple containers. I'm going to talk about it not from the development tooling perspective. I'm going to talk about it from the, uh, more of the operations end of things. And the reason I'm going to talk about that is because um, uh, that's where I focus. Um, I, I work on the Azure Container Service. Um, but what I'm going to be talking about today, whilst it is centered around Azure Container Services, the various different pieces and the open source communities, the open source tooling that's involved with that. Um, and uh, th that open source piece is going to be a recurring theme throughout. Um, some of you may have, uh, have, have come across some of the work that I do in open source generally. Um, I've been in open source for uh, about 20 years. Um, I joined Microsoft about three years ago. And I continue to do all of the same kinds of work that I did previously. Um, if you're interested in any of that work, there's various search engines that will tell you all sorts of things that, uh, that I'm involved with. Who's heard of Docker? Um, yeah, everyone, of course. I'm not going to make your hands pull, put your hands up that time. Um, but it, it, the, the point uh, when I do any session about containers, I talk about Docker first because um, Docker is, is, is kind of synonymous with containers these days. Um, Docker is, um, uh, is, um, uh, has popularized container technologies. And, and as we all know, those underlying technologies have been for, around for a very long time. And there are people running containerized applications uh, in production workloads at very, very large scales and have been doing for a very long time. But what Docker have done is they've made it accessible. OK, we all know that. We all know how easy the tools are that Docker have created for us to work with Docker containers and therefore with the underlying technologies that are down there in the kernel. And that's been great for people like me who, who don't understand that low-level stuff. I cannot, can't get my head around that stuff. But it's also great for the ecosystem as a whole. It's made it possible for a whole, almost an industry, to build up. And you have very large conference, and you walk around the, 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 the hall out there, and you see how much activity there is at every level. There's, there's startups, there's SMEs, and there's large enterprises, and everything in between are looking at this container technology that's actually been around for about 15 years, but has really accelerated as a result of the work that Docker do. Um, and for me, that's what's exciting about this space. It's that ecosystem that has been created. It's the innovation that we're seeing. But it's a bit of a double-edged sword. On the one hand, we're seeing some massive innovation, some really good ideas emerging that are beginning to mature in terms of their implementation. Um, but if you're a customer, and you're wanting to put something, a customer of, of, of Azure, where I work, and you're wanting to put something out into production, it gets much more complicated. Which monitoring solution am I going to use? Which, and there are so many things. We'll talk about different levels. Um, and so managing that can be very difficult. Decisions that you make today um, can't be based on a full understanding of what the future looks like, because there are very few of us who can predict what the future in the container space is going to look like. I know I certainly can't. Um, so Docker is much more than, than, uh, than just containers. I have a, a machine that's refusing to respond. Um, Docker is much more than containers, and Docker has made it really easy. Patrick, do you want to just play with that and try and get my PowerPoint deck to work while I continue to work? He's a Windows guy. <laughs> <laughs> it just seems to not be responding. It might be ripped the keyboard off. And, um, so 
Uh, what we're trying to do um, within the Azure Container Service is to make sure that we're able to leverage that ecosystem, leverage the innovations that are, 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 are emerging in that space, whilst enabling uh, workloads of all types to move forward. Have we succeeded? Thank you. Yay. Um, and, and so in order to do that, we, we look at, at the whole ecosystem as being more than just Docker. Docker is certainly a central and very, very important piece of that, and we've been partnered with Docker for uh, a very long time now. Um, we were on stage at, when they were announcing Docker 1.0 with the work and the integrations that we were doing uh, at that time in a company called Microsoft OpenTech. Um, we've now been uh, absorbed back into Microsoft Corp, and we're doing the work there. And, and Docker, uh, they say on one of their blog posts that, that um, containers as a service, which is what they're describing here, is a model where IT organizations and developers can work together to build, ship, and run their application anywhere. Let's just pick that apart a little bit. Build, ship, and run. A th you know, that's the whole software development life cycle right there. Build, ship, and run. That's a pretty ambitious uh, objective in the first instance. And then to do that anywhere is a real challenge. Being able to realize that takes an awful lot of work, and it really isn't as simple as it appears. It's not as simple as running Docker Run. Yes, it runs on this machine, and then running Docker Run somewhere else. When you start talking about real applications, it becomes much, much more complicated. The portability does come from the Docker containers. Increasingly, it comes from other tooling that Docker are building. The announcements around Docker Swarm, uh, Swarm mode in the engine and things like that are really beginning to move forward in the other areas. But there are many areas that aren't addressed directly by Docker, that it's addressed, but they are being addressed by the broader ecosystem. And this is just a, a short list of some of the things. How do you do your continuous delivery? How do you do your resource management within your clusters? How do you ma maintain high availability, storage, networking, load balancing, service discovery, monitoring? And we could make a very, very, very long list of things that we need to be focusing on. So what about all of those things? What about all of those other pieces? Who's going to configure all of these pieces and plug them together for us? And if we're, going to, if, we, if we're going to go the open source route, that means that we've got to build skills and expertise in so many of these different components that it becomes, for many people, prohibitive. For many people, that's an advantage, and they want to be able to do that. They want to be able to pick and choose because they want to leverage the innovations that are happening in this space. But what about other people who want to just make an easy decision? Well, the other end of the spectrum is things like the Docker data center, um, where they will, that Docker will put together a whole package of things for you. But you're still left with, OK, what do I plug in at the monitoring piece? What do I plug in in the networking piece, et cetera? And so you need to really think about these pieces in a, in a layered way. Um, and, and I'm trying to be generic with this slide. I'm just going to, to go straight forward to the next one, which is a little, little more uh, actually, I will pause on this one, uh, and then I'll skip forward to the next one. The, the, the point here is that not everything is open source, so this promise of portability actually isn't as portable as it, as it, as it may seem. It might give you portability between cloud A and cloud B, or on-premise and cloud, or whatever. Um, but if you're going to buy one of these complete stacks, if you're going to buy into one of these complete stacks, you're not portable between stacks. You, you, by the time you start building real applications, you're actually tying to that stack. Um, and so where do you draw the line? You know, do, are you aware of where that line is? And what I see with customers is that every customer wants to avoid any kind of lock-in, any kind of stickiness to, a plast to, a, to an environment, but they're all realistic that in the real world you have to make compromises. And what my customers are looking at is where do I make those compromises? What are my choices? And so with Azure Container Service, our focus is, is to say, well, you know, for us, we want to make sure that you're running on Azure. I mean, that's the truth of it. I work for Microsoft, and I work on the Azure team. I want your workloads. I don't care what your workloads are. It makes no difference to me, because I'm selling you compute time and, and CPUs and so on. It's fine. But I also want you to be able to have the flexibility to run somewhere else. Now, for a Microsoft person, that would be Azure Stack on-premise. Buy Azure Stack, go run on, on Azure Stack. But for me, as an open source guy, I want you to be able to run literally anywhere you want to. 
And so the first rule that we have with container service is that we will only use truly open source software um, within the implementation of the container service on Azure. And we'll also only, uh, we will also open source all of the, uh, the code that we use for configuring those components on Azure. So you can see exactly what it is that we've been doing in order to provide this. So you get to choose. Do you use it out of the box the way we provide, or do you take our, our uh, what we call ARM templates, which describe the way we put this together, and perhaps swap a different component in that you want in a different place? Um, and the reason we do that is because part of that portability promise that you get from Docker and the ecosystem there is that you can use the tooling that you want. You can use the tooling to manage whatever environment that you want. And so up there in the top right where it talks about container tooling, a commitment that we made when we made the original partnership with Docker a number of years ago now was that we were gonna, gonna, going to, as a company, we were going to align to the uh, open APIs that are being defined by the community, by the people in this room and in this building. And we continue to do that. And so you can run the open source software that we're creating, or using and creating, we'll talk about creating later, um, in any environment you want. You can use the tooling to manage those using any tooling you want. Um, the only kind of point of stickiness in this, for me, is at the Azure level. We'll look after the data centers, the electricity going in and coming out and all that kind of thing. And my job is to make sure that we do that well enough that you're quite happy to stay with Azure and not go elsewhere. But you can go elsewhere. That's the key point. You have the option to be portable. And not only that, but we have multiple different options of what orchestrator piece you would use or what networking piece you would use, et cetera. And so you're not even uh, uh, get finding the stickiness at those layers either. Flexibility and choice is what we're really about. Um, so these are just some examples of the technologies that we're focusing on. We, we, uh, we obviously can't do every single technology, but my last two days I've been spent walking around the halls here talking to all of the people in pieces that we need to improve on. So configuration as code, we want to be able to make sure you move these things along. ARM is Azure Resource Manager. That's specific to Azure. It tells you it's, it's the equivalent of, say, cloud formation templates on AWS. Um, but the templates we use are open source. You can see the way we configure them. But everything else, the stuff you build at the application layer, it's Docker files, it's Docker Compose. Uh, you can use Marathon if you want to. This is DockerCon, so we'll stay focused on the Docker Swarm options. Uh, the availability, well, we run about, worry about that if you're running on, uh, on Azure. If you want to run on-premise, you have the option of going Azure Stack. Uh, we're not actually on Azure Stack right now. That's in a, a preview state, and we're not there now. But if you want to run on-premise in a different environment, remember, we're only using the open source technologies. So you can take any distribution that you want to use, uh, any a configuration of those same components, and you are still using Docker file, Docker Compose, et cetera, at your application level, so you maintain that promise of portability. Um, orchestration, we have a number of options in there. Continuous integration, um, because we're just using the open APIs, you can use any CI CD system you want. Um, you're not at all surprised that you'll see us doing demos with Visual Studio Team Services, but we also do lots of demos with Jenkins. Uh, we have some internal projects that we're doing that are in this space as well. Uh, and we work with, because of the AP, open APIs, the standard Docker APIs, we work with any of the existing continuous integration and, and continuous deployment solutions. Monitoring, again, same story. We have support for some proprietary solutions like Datadog on services like Datadog. We have purely open source things like C Advisor. We also have the Microsoft solutions like Operations Management Suite. So the point being, you get to choose at each level which is the right thing to you, for, for you. What level of flexibility do you need versus the simplicity that you get when you choose to go with a particular uh, ecosystem or environment? And the story can go on. We have work on, on Docker networking, which is bringing some, uh, a Docker plugin, which will allow you to optimize for the Azure, uh, uh, Azure networking stack, but still be fully portable. If you want to run elsewhere, you drop in Weave or Coleco or something like that. Uh, and that's work that we have coming. We were... We were um, uh, we were hoping to demo that today. It is actually work that's complete, but it got pulled for something else that I'll talk about later. Um, uh, it's complete to preview status, I should say. 
Uh, storage, same thing. We just use Docker volumes, and so you can plug in whatever you need. What do you get? Well, it's just a standard thing. You get some masters with Swarm agents, with, with the Swarm uh, and the Docker engine on there, and you get some agents with the Docker engine running. And we expose those, and you communicate. In, at the moment, we communicate via an SSH tunnel. Uh, we don't set up TLS right now. Obviously, that's something that is done uh, within the Docker ecosystem. It's typically TLS you, that, that you would use, so we, that's work that's in progress. Right now, you set up an SSH tunnel, and you use the standard Docker command line tools uh, across the workload. So um, in terms of where the portability is, the application layer, you've got all that portability promise that Docker gives you. Because we're using those standard APIs, nothing changes. Orchestration layer, it's not quite as simple. There are different choices of orchestration, but we only use open source technologies there. So what choose you, choice you do made minimizes the amount of stickiness that you find at that layer. You want to use Docker Swarm? which I'm guessing many of you are here at DockerCon are interested in Docker Swarm. That's one of the options that we have in there. Um, at the infrastructure layer, well, I'm afraid we can't pick up the data centers and give, them that, give you those. So that's the point at which we're, we're saying, OK, there's only so far we can go with ensuring that you have portability. Um, so how do you deploy it? Uh, very, very quickly. I'm not going to go into, into any kind of detail with this. Um, you go to the dashboard in Azure, or you use the Azure command line tools, uh, or you use our REST APIs. Uh, you search for Azure Container Service. And um, you will find there's a number of pre-configured versions. But if I go to the, the fully flexible one, what we've tried to do is, is minimize it. Oh, I'm, yeah, OK. That's not helpful. Uh, let me do that. All right, so I, I, I just navigated through to the Azure Container Service in the portal. Um, it's very large because of the, the resolution, but you, you see you provide your username, you provide your SSH key, you provide uh, the resource group that you want to deploy it to. That's just an Azure concept of where these things, how these things are grouped together. Uh, you provide a location. You can't really see it. I'm not going to step through it. Um, the next page says what orchestrator do you want, how many agents do you want, how many masters do you want, and then that's it. We do everything else for you. We worry about configuring all these things for you. And after a short period of time, you would have a, a, a configuration uh, up and running. Um, OK. Uh, so I do actually, the next thing I wanted to do is just demonstrate that um, it is, in fact, the, the same uh, uh, um, command lines that you would expect to see. So I, I stood up a cluster earlier on. And you can see, if I do Docker info, um, you can see this is just a small three swarm agent cluster. Um, and from this point, it's all the tools that you know, the tools that you work with. So if you want to do, let's say we want to do a Docker compose, Docker compose, spell it right, up minus D. Uh, in this case, it's just starting a couple of containers. I'm going to come back to those containers that I started. But the point here is it, it is just the standard tooling. There's nothing uh, in between you and your Docker containers and the Docker ecosystem that you want to work in. Um, I'm not going to go through and show you all sorts of demos around, um, around Docker, because I'm pretty sure that most of you already know Docker pretty well. So I'm not getting my deck back. Let me just do this. Um, OK, so at this point, I want to I take a pause uh, and talk about something completely different. So I've talked about at the moment how we're consuming open source and how we're delivering open source. Uh, and I now want to uh, uh, hand over to Patrick, who's going to come from the Windows team, and he's going to tell us a little bit about how we're contributing to the open source ecosystem, in this case, specifically to the Docker ecosystem. Uh, and then I'll take over again, and, uh, and we'll look a little bit more at what that looks like. So if you want to switch over to yours. Yeah, I was going to bring this up first. I don't have those slides on here. Okay. So I'm gonna just... You carry on helping me. That's right. 
23. That's okay. Shift F5. Sorry, I forgot I had some of his slides. <laughs> All right, so we're back, back where we're at. So anyway, my name's Patrick Lang, and I work on the team that developed Windows Server containers. And so when we wanted to provide application developers the ability to rapidly deploy and scale out their applications and containers, what we wanted to do was leverage the tools that they were already familiar with. So the approach we took was, we've got some gaps in Windows. Let's work on filling those at the kernel level. But above that, we want to make sure that the tooling that everybody using is what they're familiar with. So we chose to work on the Docker engine. We did all of this work completely in the open source, um, within the open source community. And as a result of these contributions, one of our employees, John Howard, is actually one of the key contributors for the Docker engine now. So as we were developing this project, we went through the same processes, passed all the continuous integration tests, and we also contributed stuff for Windows. So what I'm gonna show next is that everything that was developed to work on top of the Docker API, for the most part, is just, just works and is ready to run. We developed it in the open source community, and we've been fixing bugs that apply to both Linux and Windows and just in order to keep all this stuff going. So what I'm going to show here in just a second is that I'm using the same Azure container service that Ross mentioned, but if you look at this diagram closely, there's a couple differences here. One of them is that we actually have a Windows agent deployed here. This is part of within the VM scale set, and then if you look in the far upper right here, you'll see there's some additional ports open for RDP. That's what Windows admins commonly use to connect for remote desktop. So now I'll go ahead and switch over to the other machine. Okay, there we go. All right, so here I have my Microsoft Azure um, portal up and running, and I've already deployed the Azure Container Service using the, using the um, ARM template that he mentioned. And I have a resource here called coffee. So just a quick, just quick aside here. I set this up last week, and then when Solomon was introducing what the sacrifice to the demo gods would be, I said, oh no, the fates have spoken. Hopefully it's in my favor, but all my machines happen to be named after coffee drinks, so let's see how this goes. So what I have in the resource group right here that was all deployed through this template is I have a swarm master this one's running Linux. It's exactly the same way it would be set up running, uh, running on, uh, or, yeah, it's running on Linux as expected. But then we also have this um, virtual machine uh, scale set. And if I find it down here, yeah, so we've got the, the agents running here. And then another thing I threw in there for this demo is I actually went ahead and pulled one of our platform as a service capabilities from Microsoft SQL Server. It was something that was production ready, so I said, I'll just plug it in and go. So I'm you know, taking advantage of some services that were already there, plus the open source code that we've done in Docker, and then the Docker Swarm engine to actually hook this all together. So to save some typing, I'm gonna go ahead and copy this in. So what I'm doing here is connecting to the Swarm master using SSH, and then I'm actually going to have local port forwarding as well, just like Ross did. And if I can remember my password, we can see that I'm up and running here. So, you know, th this is the uh, Linux Swarm Master, but I'm going to go ahead and do some management. So once I set Dockerhost to use the local Swarm Master, we can see that I've got currently two nodes deployed. They, this works just like it did on Linux, except if we look closer, we see that this is actually running Windows Server as opposed to Linux. So this is the exact same Swarm engine that's running in ACS. 
And then, of course, if I go here, I'm going to set Docker host to my forwarded port. And if I run the, the Windows build of the Docker client, it works exactly the same way. And of course, I could see all of my swarm nodes there. So this isn't a Windows port of, of Docker or Docker Swarm. It is the same code. If you go to master Docker project, all the binaries are there. They're built daily for both Linux and Windows. So now that my Swarm is here, I want to go ahead and deploy an app. So grab this. So I've got a compose file already set up. This is going to deploy a couple websites that are up and running under, under the uh, Windows Internet Information Server. So first step is we'll go ahead and do a Docker Compose build. Get a sip of coffee. All right, so we see you know, I'm pulling from an existing image that has IIS with ASP.NET configured. I'm adding in my content right now. And I'll just let that keep running. Um, but while this is running, I'll go ahead and show one of the hosts. So if I want to go ahead and connect to one of my Windows hosts behind the web browser, I can use the same familiar tools that are there. Such as remote desktop. And then when I connect to this host, we see, you know, it's just another Windows host behind that load balancer. So for someone that's familiar with, with managing Windows, they can use Remote Desktop, their familiar tool. And then, of course, for managing the Linux machines and Swarm, they're using SSH just as they're familiar with. OK, so my build completed successfully. More than halfway there. And now let's go ahead and scale this up. So Docker Compose scale, web equals 2. And it says it's already running. OK, well, there we go. I just got bit. So unfortunately, I forgot to shut this down earlier, and that mistakenly left it running. So I'm going to pull an audible right here. And so basically what I did back there was I confused the software side of my load balancer. So the way that this should have worked is that once this is up and running, when I go to the default page for these Windows servers, we see that we've got you know, the default home page running. I also deployed a second site, which is the ASP.NET core sample um, music store that's actually out there on GitHub. And then once this loads up, we'll see that we, the site is going to be up and running pretty quick. The first time it, connect, it loads up, it actually has to initialize a SQL connection and so on. But once it's initialized, it responds quickly. So that, that's two, two containers running scaled out in front of a SQL Azure backend. But this is a, a Windows workload running there completely on Azure Container Service. until now has been Linux only uh, for obvious reasons. Um, Docker is Linux first, and therefore Azure Container Service is Linux first as well. Uh, but as of um, today, um, we are opening up a uh, private preview for those people who want to look at Windows Server containers look at running Azure Container Service. Um, the next slide is the one I wanted. That one, which has the short URL uh, uh, for those people who might be interested in, in taking part in that private preview. Um, it's private preview right now, but it's the way that, that we tend to work. We do private preview first. We work hand in hand with people because we know that the, there are going well, we expect there are going to be some issues there that we need to iron out. So we work hand in hand with people. Um, and then uh, the next stage is for us to go to public preview and then eventually general availability. We did the same thing with Linux. Uh, we went into general availability with Linux back in April. 
And we're seeing significant growth in usage of the Linux environment. We're seeing a lot of interest in the Windows uh, case as well. There are a lot of customers out there who are hybrid environments, both Linux and, uh, and Windows. Um, and so if you are in that position, or if you're in Windows only, then think about signing up for this private preview. Help us take that to, uh, um, to, to completion. And more importantly still, make sure that we are actually delivering on that promise of you can use whatever tools you want. So uh, I'm a Linux guy, um, and I use Linux exclusively to, to manage my environments. Um, and so I'm certainly going to be testing this promise as to whether we can manage Linux, Windows containers from a Linux environment. And I'm sure plenty of people here would want to do the same. But the reverse is also true. People who are used to Windows and are running Linux workloads are going to want to do it the other way around. And this is one reason why right at the beginning we, we said, no, we're going to standardize on these community-defined APIs, which gives us the ability to leverage all of the innovation that's happening in the ecosystem out here and all of the wonderful um, advances that we're seeing in this technology. And so there's another element to that, um, and, and that is... How do, we, how do we as Azure Container Service bring the ecosystem to you if you choose to take this path? So what we, we've talked about how we consume open source, uh, and we've talked about how we contribute back to open source. And actually, a little side note on that. When I joined Microsoft three years ago as an open source guy, quite a lot of people were surprised. Um, three years is, is, is not a long time, but if we look at the changes around here in three years, quite a lot of people were surprised with my background in open source and, and, and what I do in the open source world. And I had my goals as to what needed to be achieved within certain time frames for me to know that I hadn't gone completely mad. Um, I have to admit that I did not think that within three years I'd be on stage with somebody from the Windows team talking about how the Windows team had contributed to open source. It was obvious for the Azure team where I work as to why we would do that, but much less obvious for Windows. And uh, it's, it's, it's uh, very exciting to be on stage with people from the Windows team doing that, that kind of work. Um, so how do we bring the ecosystem to you? We contribute to it, and we certainly use it. How do we bring the ecosystem to you? Um, and th there's, there's two things that we can look at there. Is, is monitoring is something that our customers get really confused about, and honestly, so do I. Um, which is the best monitoring solution for large-scale container deployments? Anybody in here feel they know that doesn't work for a monitoring company? Nobody. I certainly don't know. And, and frankly, none of them are really what we need. None of them are complete at this point. It's too early. This innovation is happening very, very rapidly. And everybody is working hard. There's some great solutions out there. But I personally don't believe any of them are yet complete. So um, our approach here is I just want to do a very quick demo uh, of showing how our approach uh, allows us to, um, to leverage that ecosystem, bring it to you, let you uh, experiment. So if I just switch out to my browser, there's my browser. Um, so I have a, a, another cluster. I'll come back to the Jenkins one in a moment. I, I have another cluster. I actually skipped a demo earlier, so I'll come back if we have time. Um, and I've got running on this same cluster C Advisor, and you, many of you will have seen C Advisor. It's an open source solution, does great monitoring solution, and I'm monitoring my cluster with C Advisor. I'm also monitoring the same cluster, I'll come back to that one in a moment, with Datadog. Uh, so it's the same cluster, because I'm using the standard APIs, just install the various agents that you need. You probably wouldn't want to run both monitoring solutions in a production environment, but you can run whatever production, uh, whatever monitoring solution you want. Um, you can, of course, use a Microsoft one. Um, we have a monitoring solution uh, called Operation. Well, it's, it's part of it is a monitoring, monitoring solution, which is Operations Management Suite. And they have a private, I think it's a public preview. I don't see Janobi in here, but I'm pretty sure it's a public preview now um, of container monitoring. Um, and uh, you can have that option. If you already use OMS, that's probably a good option for you. If you don't, um, then it's certainly worth looking at, along with the other, one, uh, the other options that you have outside of there. So again, how do we bring the ecosystem to you? We focus on using the standard APIs, the open source software, everything that, that we know and love. Um, the demo I skipped, I do want to come back to that one very briefly. When I talked about how do you deploy 
uh, as your container service. This is an interesting, very early stage demo. Um, it, this is a, a, a plugin uh, created by some colleagues in the dev div, that's developer division of Microsoft. And, and they've created a plugin. If I click create new item, call it DockerCon, uh, go to freestyle. Oh, I'd already done that, so we'll do DockerCon 2. Make it a freestyle project, uh, click OK. This is just a standard Docker plugin, uh, sorry, Jenkins plugin. So you do your normal build the way that you, you would want to. And then you go to your post build actions and you have Azure Container Service in there. And so in your post build action, you can provide your, your authentication details for Azure and then define what you want your, um, your cluster to look like. So how many agents, how many nodes, et cetera. If that cluster already exists, then it'll just go and deploy your application to it. If it doesn't yet exist, it will stand up that, that cluster for you, deploy your application to it. So you can be standing up clusters um, in, a, in, a in a test environment, for example, that last phase uh, testing before you push out to, to, uh, to production. Stand up a cluster, build, run your tests on it in a, in a production-like environment, very close to production environment. Once your tests have run, tear the cluster down again, and then roll your containers out to, to production. So this is an early stage experimental uh, uh, plugin that the team asked me to talk about today, get some feedback on, um, and I'd love to have feedback from you. Is this something that's useful? Can you imagine an environment in which you are gonna deploy a cluster as part of your CI solution? CD, you're not really gonna be deploying it, you, you've gotta be deploying somewhere, but is it useful in your CI solution? Um, so another aspect of bringing um, the container service, uh, sorry, the ecosystem to you is back to that innovation space. When there's a very hot innovation environment, you start to see new companies sprouting up with just new ideas that, that perhaps nobody has yet realized is a problem. Uh, and there are a number of those companies around that we're working with, but one of the ones that, that, um, that I like to talk about is a company from the UK, and you may detect from my accent that I'm biased. Any company that's from the UK gets lots of, uh, lots of attention from me. Um, uh, but um, this company is called Microscaling Systems, and they have a, a really nice solution for looking at scaling of containers. Not scaling of the underlying infrastructure of the virtual machines and so on. We do that at the Azure layer. We've got auto scaling, et cetera. But they look at scaling of the individual container workloads. Uh, and, and they're a very early stage company. They're angel funded. Most of you, if any of you, will not have heard of them. But they're addressing a really interesting space. And what they do uh, is, is they monitor what's happening in the ecosystem. Now, I started an application earlier on, and that's wired up to this uh, thing here, but I'm just, oh, it does work. Ha! Unfortunately, it doesn't work because of my thing. So the reason I'm surprised is because um, last night I sent an email to the team in England saying, hey, it's down, it's not working for me, what's going on? And they said, well, we'll try and make it work in time for your demo, and they have, but I forgot to shut down the application overnight, and so the queue is now way too long, and I can't actually do the demo as a result. We have um, 816 items in the queue, <laughs> 816,000 items in the queue. What's happening here is um, there's, there's some containers. I do actually have a video, so I'll show it you running in a moment. But to, I'd, I like to leave it on this one because you can see something's changing. So you can see the microscaling services thing actually works. And Liz is here from microscaling, so I need to leave it up there as long as possible. Um, what's happening is the dark blue are the worker containers. Those are the things that are pro processing the work items in the queue, okay? And then the light blue is a folding at home container. Um, it, it helps look for cures for cancer. And what happens if this was working correctly, if we weren't so overloaded with work right now, um, it would be scaling up the worker roles and scaling down the folding at home roles in order to be able to, to, to react to the length of the queue. So it would scale up and down as appropriate. It's easier if you actually see it uh, in, in, um, in use. So I just need to close that. I actually have a video embedded just in case I didn't get it, just in case the team didn't get it working in time. Of course, they did, and I messed up. Um, so let me just put that into projection mode. Let me fast forward, because we're at DockerCon, and I'm not showing that particular orchestrator. Um, 
All right, how do I control the video from here? <laughs> uh, all right, I don't know how to fast forward the video from here. All right, I'm going to describe it rather than rather than show show uh, show that. Um, so this is a UI of one of the orchestrators you, you, you can have on there. You can see the different containers. And what will happen in a, in a few moments is that you'll, you'll switch out to um, the, uh, the, the graph that we were seeing a moment ago, which is running on a swarm cluster. And you'll see the queue growing, the worker roles uh, uh, um, increasing in number. The queue comes down because we're processing the work. The folding at home things grow. Um, and I strongly encourage everybody to do the folding at home thing with all of your spare capacity because I'd like us all to contribute to curing cancer. Um, but if you have batch jobs and things like that, that would be another kind of workload that you would put in there. Um, so I'm going to move on from that demo. I'm very happy to, to show you the demo once I've cleared that queue out and it would work in, in real time and you would see it. But this is, this is another example of how we are working to bring the ecosystem to you. We're trying to identify people who are doing new things and enabling you to leverage those in your environments and connecting all of these different pieces together. Um, Last piece, especially since I just had the other orchestrator up there for a moment, is Docker Data Center. Where do you go if you want to go away from uh, our service, which is really just a convenience to stand up this infrastructure as infrastructure as a service? Okay, It's not a managed service. What do you want do if you want a managed service? Well, the one, another of the advantages of us only using open source technologies is that you have a natural migration path into something like Docker Data Center. We're using the same technologies. We're contributing to the same technologies. And so you can use Docker Data Center, and you can move from there into a managed service with the experts in the Docker ecosystem, Docker themselves. Or you could choose another path, because you have that flexibility. That's what we're designing into the system. So we're going to leave that one up there in case anybody didn't get the URL earlier on and you want to help us with Windows Server containers. Uh, and with that, I don't know if we have time for any questions. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have time for questions because okay. we have a, a very short turnaround. Um, yep. But will you be around the I will expo hang around. Hall? Yes, okay. I'll be in the expo hall if you have questions. Great. Thank you so much. A round of applause. And then...